So I'm very happy to announce Curtis Ovid Poe, board member of the Paul Foundation, is it? Okay. <laughs> he is um, a prolific blogger and book author. His new book is Beginning Pearl, and it focuses on the pearl you need for the workplace. But the t title may sound simple, but he covers a lot of interesting modules, and I hear it's out next month. So yeah, let's give a hand for Curtis. Thank you, that works great. Assume everyone can hear me in the back. It's not in the right mode. Of course not. <laughs> Sorry about this, folks. Arrangements. <laughs> what? Ah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for YAPCU for inviting me here. Uh, very happy to be here, particularly since my father lives about half an hour away. Lovely coincidence. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this is my first conference since uh, I finished the book. I haven't had a chance to get out and do much for a while, so it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, Giving a keynote's different from a lot of other talks because really, you know, I don't have much competition except for jet lag and your hangovers. <laughs> so I have to make something a little bit more general than I would for most of the regular talks that I do. So I started thinking about this and I started thinking, why are you folks here? And I don't mean Pearl, you're going to be getting plenty of that obviously for these, this time period. But something uh, a little bit larger in scope. So this is a question. I asked at Vienna a couple of years ago. Um, if you primarily write a lot of software for a living, hold up your hand. Okay, now keep your hands up. Keep your hands up, don't put them down. Only put them down if you do not write tests. Okay, only put your hands down if you do not write tests. Okay, you can put your hands down now. For those of you who are too hungover to look around the room, uh, I'm assuming a lot of you there, Mostly you kept your hands up, and this is different from what you would find for most of the technical community. Uh, most people are still not writing tests, and this talk is also not about testing. But what drives you to write tests? What, what's different about that? Why are you doing this than others? Because you want to excel. You want to be better than, so to speak. Um, you're going to be uh, future business leaders, you're going to be inventing disruptive bis business technologies, business practices, and different new business technologies that no one's ever seen before because you want to excel. And then you're going to go bankrupt. So let's try and avoid that. <laughs> so I started studying, doing a lot of research on what makes a great company really great, what sets them apart from everyone else. And it turns out that's really hard to do. So many studies are recommending so many different ideas, some suggesting this, some suggesting that, some suggesting the other thing, and they're often very contradictory. And then I stumbled across this one, published in the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago. And they studied over 20,000 companies, their performance for over 40 years, almost a quarter of a million years worth of data. And they discovered some very interesting things because they also started out by looking at other studies. And one of the most significant findings they found out was, <coughs> so it turns out there's a lot of statistical flaws in many of those studies out there. If I were to stand here right now and take a two euro coin out of my pocket, and I were to flip that coin and it comes up heads, and I do it again, and I do this again and it comes up heads seven times in a row, on a fair coin, on a fair toss, there's less than a 1% chance of that happening. 
And you folks are going to start asking, is that a double-headed coin? Uh, is it weighted funny? Is it something about my shirt? You know, did I lie to you about how many times it turned up heads? But, and don't actually stand up, if I were to have all of you stand up and take two euro coins out of your pockets and you start flinging them in the air, and hopefully they don't go flying all over the audience, and then I had the half that had tails sit down, and then I had you do it again, and the half that has tails sits down, and I keep doing that again, six or seven times in a row, there's only gonna be one or two people standing at the end, but this time, you're not actually gonna be surprised. Because in a crowd this size, statistically, it is likely at the end, you will have some people flip heads seven times in a row. So one of the things uh, they found out in this study is 10% of companies are in the top 10%. <laughs> That's the way this thing works. It's a serious st statistical flaw if you simply say, oh, these are the top performing companies, therefore they're doing something right. No, sometimes your competition just sucks. My favorite flaw, which they uncovered, called the Texas sharpshooter problem. <laughs> it's where you shoot first and then you announce your target. <clears throat> Not to pick on poor Mr. Cheney right there. Um, this is a particular problem which we had in these studies where they would look at a company in a particular time frame and say, wow, they're doing really well. And look at these unique business practices. But before or after that time frame, they weren't necessarily doing really well. Um, so if you just pick a particular time frame, you also have to look in the bigger picture. And this is another problem you had in these studies. And in fact, out of 13 books covering 13 studies, when you looked at the apparent superstars following their best practices and you correlated, you corrected for the statistical errors, you actually didn't have much about these companies that you could say was really making them stand out. And that was very frustrating for me because what am I gonna do if I'm gonna stand up here and tell you how to actually build a better company when all the studies are awful? I'm sorry? Oh, I will, don't worry. <laughs> So I started thinking about this problem. If I can't rely on the studies, what can I fall back on? Chess has been extremely well studied for hundreds of years. It's an extremely well-known problem space. And I used to play chess so often, an ex-partner of mine referred to herself as a chess widow. And I played against a friend of mine named Gary. And Gary, our games were always very frustrating. Tactically, Gary destroyed me over and over again. He could see further ahead than I could. He would see moves I would never think of. We'd get into a complicated tactical position. He would tear me to shreds. And the games were so frustrating because Gary almost always lost. <laughs> <clears throat> when he was manifestly a better player than I was when you look at the individual moves, but Gary didn't understand one thing about chess, which I can't say I'm great, but I did better than Gary. Between players of equal skill in chess, you know that a player with a bad strategy will tend to beat a player with no strategy. Keep that in mind, and we'll actually discuss what this means in just a moment. So a player with a bad strategy will beat a player with no strategy, assuming they're roughly equal skill. And I'm gonna assume you're roughly equal skill to your competition, so actually let's try and pick a good strategy instead. So this is what it looks like for many types of companies. You have a bad plan, which is, this is what we call waterfall. You're very familiar with this. You have to go through all the steps. You have to go through them one by one. There's no backtracking. It turns out this is an excellent design methodology for hardware. Hardware has a completely different set of constraints from software. You don't get to manufacture a bunch of CPU boards and say, oops, we screwed up our floating point calculation. Well, IBM does, but we don't. Oh, Intel, sorry, thank you. I should have known better. <clears throat> so for these companies, the worst case scenario is you tend to have lots of meetings. Uh, you have really big projects because big projects are prestigious. Agile is amateur. We don't want to have amateur there. Um, and for them, process is everything. And their entire way of thinking is designed to make you conform. It is designed to turn a person into a process. So that, that's a lot of fun to work with, by the way, I might add. So the other way we can look at it is uh, the Agile Manifesto. I'm sure some of you folks are familiar with this. Um, we value individual interactions over 
detailed processes. Uh, we want working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over negotiation, and responding to change rather than rigidly following a plan. And you might notice I have bullet points one and four bolded. Two reasons. One, I have 40 minutes for this talk. Looking at my time. Yes, I have 40 minutes for this talk, so I can't cover everything. And also, I have issues with number two and number four, or number two and number three. And it turns out it was only last Friday that I finally realized the problem I was having with this talk, that I wasn't trying to tell people how to create an agile company. I was telling people how to rewrite the agile manifesto, <laughs> which uh, I'm getting a little big for my britches. Uh, at the end of this talk, you will have a somewhat better understanding of why I have issues with number two and three, but we are going to talk about building a better company. So getting back to the idea of strategy. So for, we're talking about chess. The goal in chess is checkmate or forcing your opponent to resign. Your strategy is your plan to achieve that goal. Your tactics is the individual moves you make in support of your strategy. Now one thing a lot of players about chess don't understand, and don't worry, I'll stop the chess after this. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't understand about chess is strategy and how it works. When you make a move, that's tactics in support of your strategy. When you make a move, you ask yourself, does this move support the strategy I have chosen for this plan? If that move does not, you do not make that move. Unless it unquestionably pushes you further towards your goal. Okay, I can move my knight out and fork the king and the queen and take the queen for a knight. That's probably a good thing, even if it doesn't fit my overall strategy. But the plan is, the individual moves you make have to fit your strategy to fit your goal. For a lot of companies, they have a goal, and they just, okay, I'm going to sell more ads, or I'm going to sell more whatever, and they don't really have a strategy to do that. They just keep making moves in that direction. So we're going to actually try and pick a strategy. But first of all, your goal is your mission statement. Mission statement of a company should be short, should be sweet, should be actionable. I love the one that Kawasaki used to have. They hung it in banners over their workplace floor. It said, beat Yamaha. <laughs> that was a pretty darn good one. Everyone understood that. And everyone from the top of your company down to the bottom should know your mission statement. And they should know what it means, even the janitor. If you think janitors aren't important, sit on the toilet and reach for the toilet paper and find out that it's not there. Everybody is important. Seriously, and I'm not kidding about that one. A lot of people think that I am, but I'm not. The strategy in this case, we're going to try and build an agile company. A company that can respond fast, that can get stuff done fast, that is willing to embrace change, that is willing to overcome fear and follow courage to really do great stuff and doesn't follow the whole waterfall mess. And the tactics are going to be what I call pop. Pop is people, organization, and process. In reverse order, process is what most people think of when we talk about Agile. That's like XP, Scrum, Kanban, a couple other things in there. Um, but you need a lot more to actually create an Agile company because you have to have everything in place. You have an, have an organization which has the right mindset to make this happen. You have to choose the right people. And we're going to start with people because people are everything. Unlike a family, you get to choose the people that you work with. You can have the right organization, you can have the right process, and if you have the right people, or if you have the wrong people, it doesn't matter. If you have a bunch of people who are hairdressers and you're trying to make the next World of Warcraft, it ain't gonna happen. You have to have the right people. There is a wealth of evidence or information out there about how to actually pick good people, and I don't have the time to even begin to touch on the topic, so I'll just touch on the big one how we actually choose people through interviews. We do this all the time, unstructured interviews. We have managers who are not trained in how to interview people. Different candidates get different questions, so you can't really compare the candidates together. Uh, personality tends to be valued over performance, and at this point, these, <laughs> these interviews tend to be a farce. Are you a team player? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, what's your weakness? Uh, oh, that's what I have, actually, yes. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Yeah, everyone knows how this works. And it turns out these unstructured interviews have very little predictive power. We know this from study after study after study. You may as well be pulling a CV out of a hat at random. So we don't do interviews? Well, of course we do. We do something called a structured interview. These are actually very, very well known. 
Every candidate gets asked the same question in the same orders. They're focused on the specific skills that are actually needed, and it turns out they have excellent predictive power. The way you generally conduct a structured interview is like this. You figure out what the job is, and you do a job analysis. And you sit down, you have people write down, what are the skills you really need to have for this job to work? If this candidate has this set of skills, I know that this candidate is probably going to excel in this job. And then you develop a series of questions, uh, you know, situational, historical, technical, et cetera, designed to illustrate how well that candidate uh, fulfills that particular thing. For example, maybe you work for, do a lot of government contracts and they'll pay you a fat bonus if you actually get done on time for a change. So you want candidates who perform well under pressure. So Bob, tell me about a task you had in the past. Maybe you were on a project where you had a tight deadline where you thought you couldn't deliver in time. Tell me about that situation. And Bob might say, oh yeah, well, yeah we had to implement this cost accounting software. <laughs> it was an absolute nightmare. I mean, we were just struggling day and night. We worked a lot of overtime and we were like a month late. It was very frustrating. That's not enough of an answer, but that's what many people will accept. Instead, you want to do what I call counting the blades of grass. Grass, for each and every one of these questions, you focus on the goal, the role, the action, the score, and the speculation. All five of these points for every question needs to be covered. Okay, Bob, so you told me a little bit about this. So you had to implement cost accounting software. What specifically were you trying to do and why? This is covering the goal. And oh, we had a government mandate to implement this software by such and such a time or else we were gonna face massive fines for not coming into compliance with such and such regulations. Great, the role. What specifically were you supposed to do? And they'll tell you their job description for the task. What actions did you take in order to fulfill that job description? And then they'll come, in, come with a little bit more detail about, okay, well I did this, I did that, I did the other thing, score. Did it succeed or fail? That's very important. And it's okay if it failed. Don't worry about that. Listen to the overall process. And then you ask them for the speculation. So what went right about that thing? What went wrong about that thing? What would you have kept the same? What would you have changed? And this is where you really want to pay attention to the candidate to see how their thought process works, to see how it fits. So you go through this entire thing. For every question, counting the blades of grass, goal, role, action, score, speculation, you have to do those in different orders for each candidate for the grass, not the questions, but for the grass, because candidates will volunteer different bits and pieces of information. It takes some practice to get it right. And it turns out there's some interesting stuff about this. First of all, for a structured interview, it's kind of hard for them to lie, because there's a lot of information you're digging for, and they're going to keep going back through the past and try and figure out, okay, well, I did this, I did that, I did the other thing. So you're going to get some very interesting answers out of there and it is harder for them to lie. It's also very stressful for a candidate. They're not used to this. They're used to informal chats, which kind of go randomly. They're not used to being fired, you know, with tons of questions over and over again. As soon as you're done through all of this, you then step out of the room with the other interviewers, hopefully you have more than one, you immediately sit down, you go through every question, you rank them on a scale of one to five. I thought he was a four, I thought he was a two on this topic, why? And you keep going back and forth until eventually you have a ranking for all of them. And for every candidate, you wind up with a ranking of an objective ranking of the skills that you want them to have in order for that job. And it turns out this is very, very effective in choosing good candidates. And it's so ironic when people are everything that we don't try and choose the right people when we know that there are better ways of choosing them. There's a lot more I could say on this topic, but this is one of the most important things for people. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead to organization. So an agile organization, what is it? Agile is a state of mind. It is not a process. So it's very difficult for me to say this is what an agile organization is. But I can give you an example of an agile mindset. Um, some of you may remember back in 2010 in Iceland, the Eyjafjallajökull, the, Eye the, the Bjork volcano erupted. <laughs> And uh, how do Iceland people talk? And so the Bjork volcano erupted and it imposed a no-fly zone across Europe. Very disappointing. The hotel industry uh, was in particular, particular savaged by this because you have people with tight time frames and when they're checking into the hotel, checking out of the hotel, they don't have a lot of flexibility. 
This caused massive disruption in the industry and a lot of companies were under a lot of stress and getting a lot of negative feedback from their customers because, hey, you didn't make the planes fly. <laughs> so one company did something a little bit different, uh, Booking.com in this case. Uh, I can't tell you everything they did because they actually made a lot of changes in a very short time frame. But one thing I am allowed to share is within the space of just a couple of days, I hired almost 100 call center staff speaking multiple languages, trained them in just tiny little slices of what they needed to do to answer the phones, sat them down in phone banks with experienced call center people behind them to make sure that when you called Booking.com, you got someone, a human. A human who was working on your problem, who could speak your language, and maybe they weren't an expert, but man, they were going to try and take care of you. There's a lot of other things Booking.com did. And I no longer work for the company, but I was really impressed with this. This is what Agile looks like. I actually had some examples of what Agile doesn't look like, and my wife decided that I should not name those particular companies, so I will skip that. <laughs> so first thing about Agile organization, everyone's an owner. It doesn't matter what you do, you will take responsibility for your task, period. I don't care what it is, I don't care how small it is. You don't have a chance to blame someone else. I'm sorry, Bob couldn't deliver this thing for me on time, therefore I couldn't deliver my thing for you on time. No, that's not an excuse. If Bob can't deliver it on time, you let people know about this beforehand because that's something which changed. Agile thrives on change, it does not thrive on excuses. Everyone in the company, top to bottom, needs to understand that whatever their bid is, no matter how big or small, they own it. They are responsible for their results. Ownership implies responsibility. Responsibility requires the authority to actually make those results happen. And authority requires information. I am sick and tired of working for companies that give me a wiki that I don't have permissions to edit. <laughs> Why did you do that? They give me ticketing systems that I'm not allowed to read the tickets on them. Another team sends me an email saying, we need to get this done, here's the ticket. Can you tell me more about this task? I can't see it. I go to the guy who controls the system. I can't let you see it either. I can see it. You're not allowed to look over my shoulder. Go talk to your boss. So <clears throat> this sort of stuff happens all the time in companies. Just open up this information. Make it available for everyone. But we're going to talk a little bit more first about what an agile organization is. They tend to favor small projects over large projects because they're more likely to succeed. They value information over opinion, which is extremely important. And employees are just as important as the customers because happy employers are, employees are going to do more. But we're going to talk a little bit more about ownership just for a moment. Did you hire the right people? Because you've got to trust your employees. Again, it comes back to people over and over again, and people keep forgetting about this. They don't hire very well. If you didn't hire the right people, you are going to be hampering yourself building an agile organization. Take the time to learn how to hire them. Trust them to make those decisions. Yes, they are going to make mistakes. You can't stop them from making mistakes. They're going to learn from those mistakes. That's OK. They probably won't tear down your entire company. Decisions require information. Very important. Agile's actually, if you look at it from an economic standpoint, information actually has some very significant costs attached to it. And one of the things Agile does is it lowers costs of business tremendously regarding information transmission. Pay attention to information and making it readily available to people. So information. There's a little bit more about information that I want to talk about, some very specific things, such as log everything. <laughs> so <clears throat> logging is like digital archaeology. It'll tell you after the fact what happened when something went wrong, when a customer has a 500 error on your website that you can't replicate. It's great if your logging is so detailed. You can replay the entire session start to end. Uh, most companies don't do logging that well. It's kind of an afterthought. Do pay attention to it. It's extremely important. It is an important part of an agile organization. While we're talking about everything, logging tells you what happened. Monitoring tells you what's happening right now. That's also an extremely important thing. It's an extremely important thing, for, particularly for something I'm going to be talking about in just a moment. Uh, monitoring every employee at every time should be able to glance up at a screen on the wall and say, oh, I see what's going on. Why is cluster three falling over? It's not that you have a dedicated team of sysadmins sitting around staring at these screens all the time. Everyone should be able to just glance around and see this information. Agile is about a constant flow of information for people to be able to make the decisions they need to make right now without waiting for a change control process. You also want to challenge everything. I love this example. Um, you may recall a thought experiment that Galileo had proposed a long time ago. 
Everyone knew that heavier objects fell faster than lighter objects. And he was talking about, well, let's find out. Drop a heavy ball and a light ball off the side of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, have them connected to strings, and see which string jerks first. Now, as far as I know, he didn't actually do this. But it was a brilliant way of challenging the assumption that people make. In an agile organization, just because someone comes to you and says, this idea is going to improve things, you need to know why. Where did you get your information? How can we get more information about actually making this happen? Um, if we can't get that information, that's the that's the sort of time you want to say, well, do we actually need to do this? If we can't verify something, you know, are we taking too much of a risk of bringing something on board? Because Agile is also about managing risk and reward. We'll be talking more about that. Also, if you have an opportunity to do A-B testing, which I won't be talking about much in this talk, and you do not do A-B testing when it's appropriate, that is one of the best ways of getting information about how your customers actually behave, that ignoring it, in my opinion, is verging on negligence. Trust me, go out there, read about A-B testing. It is phenomenal. Large projects fail. I hate, it is very painful for me to put a picture of the space shuttle up here. But there are so many modes of failure for the space shuttle in so many ways. People who died, who did not have to die. The original project of the space shuttle, which was supposed to be a three-stage thing, of which the space shuttle was only the first stage, and they dumped that, and eventually they retooled the entire space shuttle to meet requirements that the Air Force had for polar orbits. And they never did those either. In so many ways, the space shuttle is a monumental failure, except for national pride, which is just a wee bit ironic, I think, in this case. And it's sad. So we don't do large projects. Um, obviously, there's major caveats to that. I mean, look at Valve software. They're very agile. They do huge projects. You break small, large projects up into small projects. And each of these small projects from this larger project should be something that can help you build towards your larger project, but it must add independent value right now. We can't build this big thing because we don't have a way of attaching appropriate metadata to these projects we have internally. So instead of building this big thing, we'll start out with a small task of building a metadata system for our stuff. All sorts of things like that. Breaking big projects into small projects and doing each of the small projects. So if the big project has to stop, you still a bunch of, built a bunch of small things which have independently added value to your company. One of the single most important things that Agile does really, really well. At 40 minutes, I don't have nearly enough time to talk about uh, making organizations Agile. Instead, I recommend that you hit your favorite search engine, also known as DuckDuckGo, <clears throat> and search for Valve New Employee Manual and download the thing. It's real. You may be forgiven if you think that a first year business student took a creative writing class in fantasy, but it's real and you'd be amazed at what they have there. Um, and it's something that most companies would not have the courage to implement. Today, many agile organizations are saying, do we need project managers? And I know of several of them which do not have project managers under the premise that if we have a project manager, our project is too complicated. Valve does not have project managers because Valve does not have managers. None. The CEO of the company, they say, if you do not answer to anyone, you do not answer to him more than anyone else. Any employee can choose whatever team they want to be on. You pick up your desk, you move it somewhere else, because all their desks have wheels. It is amazing reading through this thing. It is every employee's wet dream. It is every manager's nightmare. <laughs> Trust me. Download this manual. Find it. It is awesome. Unfortunately, I've got to move on to the next step um, because we don't have enough time to cover everything. We're going to talk about process for just a little bit. This subroutine to me was so incredibly painful. I don't remember what the subroutine did, but the shape of the subroutine is indelibly etched into my brain. It was five lines of code. Um, <clears throat> I can't begin to cover everything which happened here, but basically I was tasked with doing a code review for a junior programmer. And he wrote that. That monstrosity, which I immediately twigged on and said, why in the heck did he write that? And then I stopped and I thought about it. I can see why he wrote that. I'm going to let it slide because my standards for code review for a junior employee aren't the same thing as for a lot of you folks, for example. Unbeknownst to me, my manager was doing a code review of this guy. My manager, very brilliant guy, very sharp. He sent an email to that junior employee that he copied to me, that he copied to several other people including the subroutine, and he asked one question. What on earth were you thinking? 
I sent a very quiet email back to the manager and saying, first of all, you did not need to publicly humiliate this guy. Second, in a code review for a junior employee, I'm looking for three things. Does the code work? Is it well tested? And is it well encapsulated? Is it going to impact everything else? And it passed for all three for this junior employee. I was quite pleased with what he did. And I won't get in the background, but it actually showed some very interesting insight into his personality. The manager, a couple of hours later, sent me an email that was astounding. He, I knew his writing style. He obviously had written all of it himself. I cut and pasted it into Word. Yeah. Five pages of excruciating detail about what he is looking for for every piece of code from every single programmer. And what was really frustrating about it for me is that I could not look at a single point that he mentioned anywhere in there, because this guy's brilliant, remember, and take exception to it. Not one individual point, even though obviously I had a lower standard for these, lower, for these newer employees. So this is the difference in mindset between someone who's really comfortable with a waterfall rigid model and someone who's really comfortable like me with an agile model. He was more concerned about risk. I'm more concerned about reward. And this, I'll give you another example of this type of mindset. <laughs> this is the workflow process for a company I know. Every task, you break a task down into subtasks. Every task has to go through this workflow process. And constantly during meetings with this company, managers would say, I don't know that you're actually here and you're telling me you're in pre-prod testing, but you say that it's in development. Oh yeah, we haven't gotten there. We're, just, we're actually in pre-prod testing, but we're just trying to get stuff done. And the management would invariably respond, no, I need to know every step of the way for each of these things on all of your tickets exactly where you are so that when I pull up the ticketing system, I can get a full outline of the project in my blah, blah, blah. And the employees oh, we just want to get jobs done. So this was a huge point of contention between management and the developers. So let's look at an, I an idea of developer workflow. <laughs> can you see if there might be some room for compromise here? Maybe just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, do stuff. Shh. <laughs> so an agile workflow is about compromise. Not all tasks are going to fit the same process. Um, processes are terribly rigid. And employees are very good about ignoring the process and just getting their jobs done anyway. So for an agile environment, how do we find a way of following the employees and not just the process? because we want to focus on tasks, not processes. How do we get stuff done rather than excruciatingly monitoring it in micromanagement detail every step of the way? And by the way, testing, logging, and monitoring are a key component of all of this because you really need to know much, in much more detail than I think for a lot of other companies I've worked for what's going on every step of the way. The upside of this is you can get stuff done faster. The downside of this is you will make more mistakes, in my opinion but there'll be smaller mistakes and you can recover from them faster if you have all the information you need. So I want to keep reinforcing that bit about information. As an example of this, we can talk about continuous integration, which is really old school when you stop to think about it. Instead, I like something that we talked about. Uh, you might hear about it from time to time. We had a talk on this yesterday about continuous deployment. And this is really interesting that, um, so you work on your code, and you get done with your code, and yeah, everything looks fine. Okay, I'm going to merge it into the production branch. It's deployed right then. I've actually worked in an environment pretty close to this where I would see a bug, and I would be responsible for pushing it live, and I'd go to the website in a couple hours, uh, sometimes less if I was just really, you know, plenty of caffeine on me that day. And it is amazing what you can get done by saying, as soon as you're done with the task, deploy. 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 Over and over and over again. And it has several interesting benefits. First of all, you're doing much smaller chunks of work. You don't take down the entire site with this generally. And if something goes wrong, it's easier to roll back and do a 10-line code review instead of that 10,000-line code review because you've done your you know, one-month iteration code release. It has a huge amount of benefits. But it does have some significant risks, and you need to understand what those risks are uh, to minimize them. You need to understand what the rewards are so you can maximize them. And it does require courage over fear because you're saying, I'm going to deploy live the second I'm done writing the code. 
It really is kind of a scary environment, but it is kind of the epitome of agile in many ways. Um, and it's something that I really recommend a lot of you folks look for. Again, search engine, continuous deployment. Many companies are actually doing this, and it works. And it's great. I remember uh, one company in the Netherlands was advertising a job saying, see your code go live in just weeks. And I couldn't stop laughing because I was used to my code going live in hours. But you also have to have testing along with this. Frankly, this is uh, NASA testing a new type of hybrid rocket they were working on. I want to know that that rocket is not going to blow up before you strap it on my ass. <laughs> I don't know, just call me crazy, but really, I, I want to have testing beforehand. I want to make sure that there's a minimum amount of safety. And with testing, then you have the full scale integration of what's happening with your code. Testing to find out what happens before it's released. Monitoring to find out what's happening during release. Logging to find out what happened after release. At this point, once you get all of this into place, and it can be tough to do, that's a great place to start saying, now I can really, really get out in the more wild, agile areas, because at any time I can find out what's actually going on with my stuff, and I can recover faster than a lot of other com companies. So, agile project management. Are we talking about XP, Scrum, Kanban, Crystal, something else? One thing which is really interesting about them, every single one of them describes themselves not as an algorithm, they are a heuristic. It's not a set of precise steps necessary in order to get stuff done, but a guideline. And they say, you need to readjust this to fit your organization and your culture. And as soon as you do, someone's going to come along and say, oh, that's not agile. You didn't do what they said. You're not pair programming. Therefore, you're not agile. Out of curiosity, how many folks in this room are pair programming? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. I see like two hands up there. Um, and I'll bet you're still getting stuff done, even though you're not agile. <clears throat> so don't overly worry about what methodology you take. Just pick a methodology, invent a methodology, understand what the trade-offs are, what the strengths are, what the rewards are. And that is going to get us back to the idea of how to implement, actually put all of this together to create an agile company. POP. People, organization, and process. Becoming agile is very, very difficult to do. It actually takes a lot of work. It's a big project. It's an agile project, of course. What this actually means is it's too big of a project for you to do, so you shouldn't do it. You should break it down into smaller projects. Each of those smaller agile tasks that you want to convert your company into should independently add some sort of value. You do them one step at a time with the highest value tasks first. So hiring, that's one of the frustrating things. It's actually kind of easy once you understand some of the hiring processes which are out there, some of the ways you can do a better job of picking employees. But it's also hard because you may not be hiring enough. You may have a bunch of long-term employees. And I believe Donald Rumsfeld, a famous programmer, said you go to work with the employees you have, not the employees you want. So you might be able to get away with that. But it's a great place to start, but it takes a while. So you're not going to get results from that right away. So everything else, talk to your employees. Find out what's really irritating them. And if you talk to enough employees, you're going to find common themes of irritation with all of those employees. <clears throat> and start picking them apart, which ones are easy to solve, which ones are hard to solve. Analyze the risk-reward ratio of all of those. How can you minimize the risk? How can you maximize the reward? And remember the Pareto rule. 80% of your results tend to stem from 20% of your actions. Waterfall says, we're going to do 100% of those actions. Agile says, well, let's look at this first 20% first. You actually get great results from that, and it's worth taking the risk for. Once you go Agile, never forget your goal. Remember, Agile is just a strategy to achieve your goal. Always question your processes, the tasks you take to implement your strategy of being Agile. And remember, it's a mindset. It is not a process. So coming back to the Agile Manifesto, which I alluded to near the beginning of the talk. Uh, don't worry, folks. I'm almost done. So people over process and change over plans, I kind of buy into those, those points one and four. But I have issues with two and three. Software over documentation is a big one for me. First of all, anyone know the origins of Kanban? It's uh, from Toyota. Easier way of manufacturing cars, implementing just-in-time inventory. That's not software, but it's very agile. So saying software in the Agile Manifesto is kind of trying to pick, a, 
pick out a point which is a little bit too detail oriented for my mind. And software over comprehensive documentation. What if you're writing space shuttle software? Do you really want people to wing it? What if you're writing software which is a medical diagnostic software or radiation for killing someone's cancer? Do you really want to not have tight predetermined specs for that? You might have ethical or legal reasons why you might want to make sure that you have comprehensive documentation up front because you don't want to take that chance. Now, admittedly, that's fuzzy, and I know what they mean by documentation, so people can argue with that, but the software point, software is too much of a detail. So I actually have issues with number two. Customer collaboration over negotiation, I like this. So if you look in the dictionary under collaborate, it's uh, to work with one another. Uh, negotiate is to deal or bargain with one another. That's an awfully fuzzy line between negotiation and collaboration. Um, I don't like the fuzziness of that line because it doesn't really give me a lot of information. Furthermore, the customer is not always available. Even if you give someone to act as a proxy for the customer inside of your company, it doesn't mean that the customer, the person who's actually paying you money, is available. What you think customers want and what customers actually do are not necessarily the same thing. So number three, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I'm going to toss that out entirely. And this is my Agile manifesto. This is what I am looking for. I want to value people over process because I think that's extremely important. Information over opinion. Agile means responding fast. You have to have that information. You don't want a gut instinct that your company is dependent upon. You want to be able to say, yes, this is really true. I think that is extremely important for Agile because Agile is a better way of sharing information in companies. So promote this to a first level point in the Agile manifesto. Courage over fear. Agile, we know we have risks. We know we have rewards. How do we minimize the risks and maximize the rewards. Pay attention to both, but we want to be able to take those risks. We want to be able to take those bold leaps where no programmer has gone before. It is important. Courage over fear. And finally, the last and for many people the most important point, embracing change over rigidly following plans. That one I'm still going to stick with on the Agile Manifesto. So I know some others might take exception with this, but this is my Agile Manifesto. I think it works better than the original one. It fits better with the idea, in my opinion, of POP, the entire cycle of people, organization, and process for creating an overall agile organization, which is going to allow you to get things done, going to allow you to get things done faster, with less stress, and plenty of information to find out that you're actually doing the right thing. And it's actually a lot of fun to go that route. I've been there, and it's a blast. So go out, enjoy your coffee, your snacks, and have a good time. <laughs>